working moment. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Yvette Fuentes. So she started her career, uh, you know, around 2000s and she was doing quantum optics and quantum information primarily that time. I think since then, when she moved to Perimeter Institute, her, her interest uh, shifted to the interface of, uh, you know, quantum information and gravity, sometimes using quantum optics like techniques, I guess. And she's also an expert on BECs and on uh, quantum field theories in curved space time. So let us uh, hear from Yvette. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful for this um, invitation, especially because what Sugato says is like, a, well, it's, it's, we, we in, um, met each other a long time ago and I wrote my first papers in, in quantum optics with, with him and learned a lot from him. So I'm, I'm very grateful for, for this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about my work on how can you use phonons in a BC for fundamental physics. And this is a, a work, well, it's, it's work that uh, summarizes a lot of different, um, let's say papers and so that we worked through the years, but the more recent one is with Richard Howell, who was my postdoc and now is in Hong Kong and in Oxford. Um, I want to start by acknowledging all the contributions because like I said, this brings together a lot of work over the years. So these are postdocs and former PhD students that uh, contributed to this work, as well as uh, collaborators in theory and in experiment. So there are many interesting fundamental questions that are still unanswered. For example, what's the na nature of dark matter or does the equivalence principle hold for quantum systems? There's many different interesting questions. And well, as you know, in um, recently there's been a interest in the UK to push on how can we use quantum systems to answer questions in fundamental physics. And there was last year a school where um, people talked about different possibilities and, um, and tried to build a bridge between the community working on quantum technologies and fundamental physics. And I found an interesting comment in the uh, audience by someone who pointed out that underlying most of these questions are our difficulty to find a consistent theory at the interplay of quantum mechanics and general relativity. So, uh, well, they're, they're quite different theories. So in quantum mechanics, uh, the underlying transformations are the Galilean transformation. So uh, time is absolute and Schrodinger equation considers that time is absolute and space and time are treated very differently. In the Schrodinger equation, we have a second derivative in uh, space and the first derivative in time. And we get effects like, for example, particles can be in a superposition at two different positions at once. Whereas in relativity, time is an observer dependent and actually time and space are uh, belong together in a higher dimensional object that we call space time. And then we get some um, other effects such as time flows different um, at different rates and different points in space time. So we don't know how these uh, effects uh, interplay, uh, for example, the superposition principle with um, time dilation and so on. Uh, an interesting question would be like, do we gravitize, uh, gra do we quantize gravity or gravitize quantum mechanics? This would be, should we keep the uh, principles of quantum mechanics and modify gravity or keep the principles of general relativity and modify quantum mechanics? And I think experiments should be telling us about this. And most probably we would have to modify both, but it's interesting to make experiments so we know which principles from each theory we, should we keep. Um, in my opinion, the most important question right now is um, comes from being able to put a massive system in a quantum superposition, because this would tell us is a space time itself can be put in a superposition of two different configurations. And uh, Roger Penrose, for example, thinks that this is not possible at the Planck mass at which um, the self-gravity effects should be collapsing the, the wave function. 
But I guess that the main point is that we don't have any experiments or instruments to look at these uh, scales where we expect quantum theory and general relativity to interplay. So I had this picture here, uh, kind of thinking about how would people do cosmology, for example, if they didn't have telescopes and can only look at the stars. And then, well, Galileo invented the telescope and now they have developed very much and we can learn things like the universe is expanding and, you know, that there's probably something we call dark matter because uh, the way galaxies behave does, doesn't really add up to the predictions of general relativity and so on. So I think the lesson I've learned is that we first have to develop these technologies and then do more significant theories. Same with the microscopic world, the Greek came up with the idea of the atoms, but it's until you make a microscope that you can actually really start doing atomic physics. So in order to build an instrument that allows you to um, explore scales where maybe new physics uh, needs to be developed uh, to describe those scales, uh, you need to use what you have at hand. You need to use, say, patches. You can't build an instrument without an idea. Yes? Uh -huh. All right, it's my final Oh, sorry, I'm not hearing very well. Yeah, I, I think there was just for some sound from someone. So I think. Uh, oh, okay. Is yeah. less managed. Okay. So, so my, my point is, is just that you need to um, uh, use what you have of theory at, at hand to propose experiments and propose different instruments. And then from when we are able to reach those scales with the experiments, we will be able to refine uh, those um, theories, especially focusing on what are the principles that we should keep from, from each uh, theory. So when we think about uh, quantum physics, we always think about small scales and general relativity about big scales, but the development of quantum technologies uh, recently has kind of blurred these lines. So for example, there are experiments using satellites that uh, distribute entanglement at uh, thousands of uh, kilometers. So at this um, uh, scales, relativity kicks in because the proper time on Earth is different to the proper time in satellites. So this needs to be taken into account. So an interesting question is, what are the effects of gravity on quantum properties such as entanglement or superposition and, and so on. So this is a line of research that I'm interested in. And I have a series of uh, uh, articles in that direction, but I'm not gonna talk about that, but I, I think it's um, an interesting thing to look at. Then the other thing is that uh, we usually also thought about quantum mechanics as applying to a few particles. However, Bose-Einstein condensates can have up to, for example, in um, hydrogen, 10 to the 10 atoms cool down to the ground state so they can reach half a nano Kelvin, very, very cold temperatures. And at those temperatures, the individual wave functions overlap and the BC behaves like a big quantum system. So there's many groups in and including the, the, the ideas of um, Sugato and Anupan trying to create uh, superpositions of massive particles and then uh, let's say of two and see if they entangled and so on to find out if uh, gravity has an, a quantum aspect to it. And I take in, uh, most of these involve solids like diamonds and, and um, beads and mirrors. And I've taken a slight different uh, path to that considering Bose-Einstein condensates uh, to test some aspects of these interesting questions. So this is another way to reach uh, relativistic regimes is through large mass and also using quantum precision. So when I started to talk many years ago to my colleagues in gravity that I wanted to use quantum systems to measure time dilation and space time curvature and things like that, they laughed at me because they said at small scales, space time is basically flat. But what they didn't know is how precise quantum systems can be. So an atomic clock reaches a um, accuracy of 10 to the minus 18. And at those scales, you can already see time dilation. So there's this beautiful experiment by Day Weinlein. And if we, he puts an atom at 33 centimeters uh, separated and he sees uh, uh, time dilation. 
So now with the accuracies that they have, you can see that within a centimeter. And if you start going beyond that, well, the uh, atomic clocks are a, a bunch of atoms in a potential, and you'll have atoms on the top that see a proper time different from the ones below. And well, if you they're independent, this might not be a problem. You might be able to calculate and correct for that. But if you wanted to entangle, the, let's say, the atoms to get better accuracies, then you will even lose what your notion of time is. So these, uh, um, you know, the idea of, of time and of measuring space-time parameters becomes very interesting at the interplay of quantum mechanics and general relativity. So what we're trying to do in our, our group is basically use quantum field theory in curved space time instead of quantum mechanics to come up with proposals for new experiments and new technologies to try to reach these scales and hopefully from the experiment be able to make better theories. So when you think about using uh, cold atoms, quantum, uh, um, at, well, yeah, atoms in, in quantum states to measure gravitational effects, the first thing that comes to mind is atom interferometry. So I wrote here that it's a single particle detector because in spite that you usually throw, I don't know, 10 to the six, 10 to the eight atoms into in the interferometer, each atom is independent. There's no interactions, interactions are avoided. And each atom goes into a superposition of two different trajectories, which are different. So the trajectories pick up information, for example, of the local gravitational field, and then they recombine at a point. So in that sense, I wrote here that it's local because the interference occurs when you recombine the two trajectories into a point. And from the interference pattern, you can uh, learn information about the local gravitational field, for example. So I point out here that this is interferometry in the spatial domain because each atom has two different trajectories in space and it's limited by the time of flight. So it's a very simple equation that you get. The precision goes like the number of measurements that you make. So that would be like the number of atoms that you can throw and maybe you want to integrate that in time, the mode number, and most importantly, the time of flight squared. So the limiting factor, it's interferometry in space and the bigger it is, the more precise it is. If you make it smaller, you lose precision. And I wrote here that this is compatible with Newtonian physics because usually, well, not the experiment, the experiment is just the experiment, but the description, the theoretical description that we give of atom interferometry is usually using the Schrodinger equation in which um, all equations and inner products and so on are Galilean invariant. Uh, and this is compatible with Newtonian physics. If you wanted to go beyond uh, the Newtonian physics, then, well, you run into problems because quantum mechanics and general relativity are incompatible. So I think an uh, interesting problem is to be able to describe um, interferometry with photons and, and atom interferometry beyond Newtonian physics, but one needs to be very careful with one how one does that. Um, so now uh, we are proposing in my group a different way of doing interferometry that allows you to measure gravitational effects uh, in very small uh, systems. So now instead of having your, and using cold atoms, instead of using your atoms in free fall, now you're going to trap them, let's say, in a square potential. It could be a different potential becomes mathematically more complicated. So it's quite easy in a box potential. And instead of now trying to avoid interactions, you let the atoms interact. So they give rise to collective excitations. They're called phonons. And these phonons are a massless relativistic quantum field. And you get the atoms uh, collide and they get entangled and they can uh, be uh, put into quantum states like squeezing and so on that are very sensitive states. So, I mean, this idea you could implement in other systems, perhaps in superconducting circuits, for, for example, but I'm going to focus in an implementation today using these phonons of a BEC. And now we call it interferometry in the frequency domain because we're not going to use states of atoms that are in two different positions in space, but these phonon modes, these collective excitations, are sharp in frequency and completely delocalized between these 
uh, uh, modes. So you can now pick two or more modes and do an interferometry uh, protocol with them in order to measure the parameters of interest. For example, today I'm going to tell you about gravitational waves. And here I say that this interferometry is non-local because they don't recombine into a point where they interfere, but the states are in contact, the atoms are in contact all the time, so um, the interaction is non-local. When the atoms collide, this is um, a nonlinearity in the Hamiltonian, and this gives rise to parametric amplification. So parametric amplification is something that we are going to be exploiting, which is basically squeezing, in order to make very sensitive measurements. And now I write here that this scheme is compatible be with general relativity because we build it not using the Schrodinger equation, but underpinned by quantum field theory in curved space-time. So basically we're using the Klein-Gordon equation and equations and inner products that are Lorentz invariant. There is a possibility of describing this as well in the Newtonian regime when you make approximations, but the way that we've built it was already using quantum field theory in curved space-time. So quantum field theory in curved space-time is not the ultimate theory. Um, it's like a, a semi-classical theory in which we consider a classical space-time background given by the um, Einstein equations, and then you study how quantum fields behave under this um, uh, background. And um, it's not quantum gravity and it's not the full theory in the sense that it doesn't consider what, in my opinion, is the most interesting question. Um, there's some kind of funny noises, but it, it doesn't it doesn't take into account backgrounds. So it doesn't study how the quantum fields themselves affect the space time or curve the space time. So in this sense, it's semi classical. And it reminds me a lot when I studied um, quantum optics in Imperial with, with um, uh, well, Sugata was already in Oxford, but um, that with semi-classical um, uh, quantum optics, uh, opt well, yes, you, you could learn a lot. So basically you would quantize matter, consider two level atoms, but take into account the, um, the field, the electromagnetic field to be classical. And if you added phenomenologically uh, quantum uh, vacuum fluctuations, you almost could describe everything. I mean, photoelectric effect, um, quantum effect, many of the effects can be uh, described in this way. So that's what I believe nowadays that um, you can use quantum field theory in curved space time has not been used for any technological development, for any experiment of this kind. Uh, and yet I think it has a lot of possibilities. So Sugato and Anupam are trying to go beyond this and really go into the quantum gravity and really learn how massive systems curve space time and so on. And uh, my program, let's say it's a little bit more modest in the sense that I'm not going to those scales, but I do think that as we move towards those scales, quantum field theory in curved space time might have a lot uh, to offer. Now, quantum field theory in curved space time has not been proved in the experiments. It quantum field theory has been demonstrated many times in CERN and Fermilab and, uh, and many different experiments. However, the curved case, not yet. And that's, I think, another interesting thing of the proposal is that we're challenging some of the beliefs in the community that you can only prove the predictions of this theory in um, the lab by analog uh, systems, but we think you can actually measure the real thing. So the theoretical predictions of this theory are, are very well known. I mean, just to give you an example, Hawking radiation is a prediction of this theory, as well as the Undru effect uh, and davis fulling Undru effect and uh, particle uh, creation by uh, the dynamics of space-time. But all of these are believed, well, um, playing with a black hole is, is, is impossible, but many other effects are believed to be too small to be able to be seen in the experiment. Uh, for example, in the flat case, the dynamical Casimir effect, you have a mirror moving and you can see that you would create a particle in the lifetime of the sun if you move a mirror at 10 to the um, 18 meters over a second squared, which are the accelerations reached in um, CERN, so it, it looks very unlikely, but um, I'm going to show you that using phonons in a BC could be a first step in this direction. 
So the general idea is that um, you take a, a quantum system that has um, frequency modes and you pick uh, a set of them. And then you do the first, like the interference part would be, uh, you can beam split them as in a typical interferometer, but this is in the frequency domain. But you could also do a bit more than that. You could squeeze them, you can entangle them, you can do some unitary transformation on them. Then that is your initial state and it interacts with something, could be a gravitational wave or the local gravitational field, a source of dark energy. And then you close the loop in your interferometry um, uh, protocol by applying the inverse transformation and then you make measurements. So because now we're not using um, interferometry in space, which is limited by the size, but we're using interferometry in frequency. Now what really is limiting us is time. So it's the lifetime of the phonos that are really becoming the limiting factor. But if you are able to get long phonon lifetimes, then you could miniaturize detectors. So um, people working in atom interferometry are very interested in miniaturizing um, atom interferometry. But when you do that, you lose the, the precision. So you need to change the paradigm on how you do that. And by trapping the atoms, instead of letting them be in free flight and using these frequency modes, then in principle, you should be able to do have very sensitive detectors in a very small um, scale. So we've been studying this for many years, and this has, has some high sensitivity and very interesting features with respect to resonance to noise. And we've studied, for example, how could you detect continuous sources of gravitational waves? So these are not the gravitational wave mergers that you get in LIGO, uh, because those are very short-lived and that doesn't work very well for, for this setting. But there are other interesting sources of gravitational waves that are long-lived, like glitches of uh, neutron stars and so on, which are important. Um, in order to understand the physics of neutron stars, you need to reconstruct the uh, equation of state. And for that, you would be is necessary to detect gravitational waves. So even in LIGO, there's a very important program trying to detect long-lived gravitational waves. So that's what I'm going to uh, focus on today. Uh, but we also have some work on constraining dark energy and fifth forces models, uh, proper acceleration. Uh, we're uh, patenting at the moment and it's going pretty well a uh, version of this on how to detect the local gravitational field and its gradient. And we have other um, um, ideas on uh, curvature, space-time parameters, other space-time parameters and uh, dark matter, which I'll talk a little bit about that. But as, as I was saying, if we can show that changes in the space-time produces changes in this relativistic quantum field, then this would be a first demonstration of the principles of quantum field theory in curved space-time. So uh, how it basically works is that you put your BEC on a back box trap and prepared a very sensitive state. Usually a two mode squeeze state would be uh, your best choice. And then uh, a gravitational wave comes by or the local gravitational field changes your state slightly and you measure. And we came up with this proposal in 2014 but the initial proposal required high, high uh, phono numbers. So the squeezing had to be pretty high of the order of the square root of the number of atoms and uh, long phono lifetimes. So we didn't find in the literature because there wasn't, there are many studies about how long phonons live. So we had something like 10 seconds, which was based on what we could find. However, there has been criticism to our proposal because of that. And what I'm going to show you today is that if you add some other uh, transformations into your state and you find, say, a more clever initial state, then you can overcome these limitations and still have good sensitivities um, in spite of having much shorter uh, phonon lifetimes. So we uh, wrote in this paper recently a three-mode application of frequency interferometry in which we use the, the ground state of the BEC. So this is like the one described by the Gross-Pitayeski 
equation, the, the bulk or the, the pump, and you prepare that in a coherent state. And then the collisions give rise to two frequency modes that you can excite and create a two-mode squeeze state by changing the size of the box. And then also by uh, changing um, or interacting with light and so on, you could create a transformation that's called a tritter. So this is basically a BIM splitter between the three states. And now this creates a very um, sensitive state, especially because then the total number of atoms come into the, the, the equations from uh, interacting the entangling, let's say the pump. This is the gravitational wave and then the inverse transformation and you measure. So in the old scheme, we just had uh, two phonon modes, two mode squeezing, the gravitational wave and measurement. And now we add the tritter and the inverse transformation. And this gives us, we improve the sensitivities by many degrees of freedom, sorry, by many orders of magnitude and allows us to consider much smaller squeezing and also a short phononic lifetimes. So um, a Bose-Einstein condensate, you could describe when all the atoms are in the ground state by a mean field a function that obeys the gross pitayevsky equation. But because the atoms collide, you need to look at perturbations to this, which are your phonons, which are these relativistic quantum uh, fields. And um, in the case where the density of the VC, which is given by the wave function um, in this way, when this is um, quasi-uniform or uniform, the equations uh, become a bit simpler. So this is an experimental demonstration of a BC in a box potential made in Cambridge. So um, you usually describe a Bose-Einstein condensate with a Hamiltonian uh, in a non-relativistic Hamiltonian because most of the experiments of interest are uh, don't need to deal with the underlying space-time. However, there is a very nice way of describing the Lagrangian of the BC in a fully covariant way. So here you have the uh, kinetic energy of the atoms and you can see here the metric of the underlying space time. And this is the potential uh, that we're in our case, we consider the box potential and a relativistic correction to that. And these are the interactions of the um, atoms. And when you have this um, uniform density uh, and you use this ansatz plug it into the equations of motion, basically taking the mean field plus the phononic corrections to that, you will get that the phonons obey a Klein-Gordon equation in an effective curve metric. So this is an equation that treats space and time at an equal footing. They're both two derivatives in, um, in space and in time. And it depends here of the underlying space-time metric and its determinant. So uh, when you plug in the ansatz for the um, wave functions of the atoms in this way, you find an effective metric. And the effective metric depends on the density of the BC, which is in this case uniform, the speed of sound, the speed of light. This is the underlying space-time metric. And these are the velocity flows. So um, perhaps you've heard of the field of analog uh, gravity, in which they try to simulate black holes or gravitational waves or uh, different metrics in the lab. So basically what they do is that they play with the speed of sound, the uh, density and the flows to make this side behave like a metric you want to know. So for example, Jeff Steinhauer in uh, Haifa did a, not a full like structural black hole, but a um, waterfall uh, horizon with these flows and demonstrated some aspects of Hawking radiation. But the problem with analog gravity is that you can't falsify a theory. Uh, you can maybe simulate something and make it behave in a way. So I love that you know, field and I have some papers on how could you simulate a chameleon fields, for example, in a BC. But that, if you can simulate in the lab a very funky chameleon field, doesn't mean that out there in nature, those fields um, describe the universe. So uh, you learn consistencies about the theory, but you can't falsify the theory by a simulation. 
So we've been more concerned if real changes in the underlying space-time metric would produce observable effects on the phonons. And while our theoretical calculations show that this is pr in principle possible, and as I mentioned before, if we were able to see that, that would be a first step towards demonstrating quantum field theory in curved space time or demonstrating some of the fundamental principles of the theory. So um, we work with the Klein Gordon equation in the effective curve metric, but we impose boundary conditions because our, syst our, our system is finite and it's um, localized in a potential. Oops, um, sorry. So then we get, we quantize the field by finding solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation. So when the space time that we choose has a time-like killing vector field, we can distinguish positive frequency modes from negative frequency modes and associate creation operations, uh, creation um, operators and annihilation operators in a distinguished way. And by that, we can build a um, um, uh, operator value function that satisfies the Klein-Gordon equation, and that's how you quantize uh, the field. So in the in the flat case, and here we look at just one plus one dimensions. In this case, it's very simple because the Klein-Gordon equation is just a wave equation, and the time-like killing vector field is just dt. So you can always make this distinguish uh, distinguish uh, positive and negative frequency modes. And then the solutions are these sign, well, they're exponentials, but when you impose boundary conditions, you get these sign functions. And you can see here, you have your discrete um, uh, spectrum. In this case, we did it with mass, but where uh, phonons are massless. So you would just make the mass zero. And then you can quantize your field associating the creation and annihilation operators now to these functions, which um, consider the boundary conditions. So in flat space for the phonons now using the effective metric, you see that the metric looks very similar to the flat metric, only that the speed of sound here replaces the speed of light and you have this conformal factor. But because the field is massless, this conformal factor you can just uh, ignore. And basically the main change is that you have the speed of sound instead of the speed of light. And the frequency of the phonons, depend on that speed of sound divided by the length of um, your BEC. And what we're gonna do with gravitational waves is that we're gonna find two phononic modes that resonate with the gravitational wave and two modes squeeze those modes um, and then let the gravitational wave change the state. So this is the metric of a gravitational wave is the flat metric plus a small perturbation. And this is a small perturbation, which has a quadrupolar characteristic to it. And when you look at now what the phonons see, the metric that the phonons see, again, is very similar to the usual metric with the speed of sound instead of the speed of light. And again, the conformal factor. Now, um, for today, I'm just going to focus in a one plus one dimension, like in a one dimensional trap, a one plus one metric. And in that case, the perturbation, since I mentioned we're going to look at only continuous sources, the uh, perturbation is a wave which is, has a characteristic amplitude and a given uh, frequency. And this is a long lived uh, source. So that's where we find the resonance with the frequency of the gravitational wave and the modes of your phonons. So this is again how the circuit looks like and giving you a bit more mathematical detail. We work in the covariance matrix formalism that is very common to be used in quantum optics. You use the symplectic um, um, matrices instead of uh, unitary matrices. It just makes everything much simpler when you stick to Gaussian states. So this is how the transformations, the two mode squeeze state and the tritter look in that formalism. And the gravitational wave, the interaction of the gravitational wave with your states is described through Bugalubov um, transformations. So we've used, we've developed our own techniques to describe this in confined um, uh, fields. So this is work that started in 2012 in flat space, but now we have been um, generalizing these techniques uh, to quite uh, general settings considering curved space and different types of boundary conditions. So this is quite recent work. 
Um, so we apply then quantum metrology techniques in which um, you have a strategy for choosing good initial states, giving a transformation. So this could be your gravitational wave, uh, such that the uh, output state encodes the parameter you want to measure. And if you look at the fidelity of the state with a state that is infinitely close to it, then you can see um, how well you can estimate the parameter. So if this is equal to one, the state basically doesn't change and you can't estimate anything. And in the measure that this fidelity is much smaller than one, it tells you how the, the smaller it is, the better you can estimate the parameter. So using uh, quantum metrology, the error in estimating, say, the characteristic amplitude of a gravitational wave is bounded by the number of measurements that you make and the quantum Fisher information. And this basically depends on this overlap. It's just that here I write it in more general terms because um, uh, it, this is for mixed states. And when you take two modes, you have to trace all over the others and you're usually left with a mixed state. So that's why that's the sort of um, mathematical techniques that we use. So we calculated the quantum fissure information to find a bound on how well can we estimate the amplitude of a gravitational wave in this way. And this is the result. So you probably remember this from one of my first slides where for atom interferometry, it just depends on the mode number. These are the, now we have two modes. So these are the mode numbers and the, um, time of flight squared. Well, now we have a more complicated equation and it depends on the atomic species of the BC on the Tritter angle. So you're like three-way beam splitting angle on the total number of atoms in your bulk on the number of atoms that you're able to squeeze. And these are really parameters related to the size. So it depends on the area and the length of your BC. And this is the integration time and the time of flight. Now, this is, well, obviously a, a complicated equation and it's also all the parameters are interconnected and you have some constraints that I'll tell you about in a moment. But this is like um, an optimal plot done by Don, Dan Goldwater, um, my former postdoc, in which he did some numerical work optimizing on um, these equations, taking into account uh, all the constraints that you need to consider. And you can see that in principle, you should be able to reach quite high sensitivities at uh, high frequencies and talk a little bit about this frequency range in a moment, but this is already taking into account sources of noise. The worst source of noise is three body recombination. So the constraints are that you need to be in the phonon regime. So this is a constraint on your um, on, on your spectrum, on um, uh, the, 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 the frequency. So you, so you need to satisfy this condition. This is the scattering length. And you also need to be in a low thermal regime, but you can get that just by having a BC, which is very cold. And also we're working in the weak interactions regime. So you need to make sure that all your parameters satisfy these um, phonon regime, weak interactions, ultra cold regime, and so on, but also you get decoherence. So we made an in-depth study of decoherence of phonons in a BC in which we considered two body losses and three body recombination. So that also sets constraints on all your parameters. And more recently, one of my master's students in Vienna wrote his thesis on how giving initial temperature, size of your BC and your parameters of your trap, how much could you squeeze phonons taking into account the constraints, three body recombination and so on. And then we use the results of that thesis and we put them into um, our frequency interferometry um, protocol. And this is uh, the numbers that we find. So you can see here, uh, for example, for quite big BACs, 10 to the nine atoms. So this might be a big challenge. But uh, we show how using the Tritter operation improves the uh, protocol from 10 to the minus 11 that you would get without the Tritter to 10 to the minus 21. And the reason why the improvement is so big is because that 
Schroeder operation brings in the total number of atoms squared into the equation, which improves sensitivities very high. So um, whereas we had 10 seconds as phono lifetimes in the past, now we can find more realistic phono lifetimes and still get very good sensitivities. So obviously if you could, oh, this is just a paper of a group in 26 that made had a sodium BC with 10 to the uh 10 to the eight atoms so this shows that getting quite high atom numbers well here we have 10 to the nine but 10 to the eight is is in principle possible with current technologies but obviously getting higher you know like in atom interferometry the bigger it is the more sensitive it is here the higher the 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 longer the phonons live, the better sensitivities you get. And this just shows you how the sensitivity behaves. If you were able to get, let's say 0.6 seconds, you would get really, really high sensitivities. But this is the challenge here is controlling three body recombination. And um, then I compared the optimal sensitivity plots that Dan made with models that I found for um, glitches of neutron stars which predict um, characteristic amplitudes between 10 to the minus 22 and 10 to the minus 24, just to show that this is in principle promising. And um, this is again, the optimized curves showing that we're not competing with LIGO because the frequencies are much higher. We're also not competing with atom interferometry because atom interferometry could detect gravitational waves in uh, around 10 to the minus 20, 10 to the minus two hertz. So this is, this is um, like I said, complementary. Now, known sources of gravitational waves uh, come up to 10 to 10 kilohertz. And beyond that, we don't know. We expect some exotic sources, such as boson stars or cosmic rings. And I'm especially interested in dark matter. Um, let me uh, show you, well, I'll come back to that maybe. This is a, a plot that I got from a slide from John March Russell from Oxford, and he was explaining how in CERN they were looking for single particle events of um, dark matter, scattering of dark matter, and they look at this energy scales and didn't find anything. So if CERN wanted to push this further, they would have to build a bigger apparatus, and you know how expensive that I, this, I don't know, 60 billion euros something around that. And he was telling us how, because of that, people thinking that, well, that doesn't really make much sense. Then the community has been trying to look for alternatives and in particular using quantum technologies as alternatives. So they looked at, instead of single particle scattering events to collective behavior. So there are some models that predict that dark matter could have some sort of bosonic behavior and produce um, not gravitational waves, but space-time perturbations that are um, senosoidal and um, monochromatic. That's exactly the sort of signal that we were studying. So I found that very interesting. And then I looked at what would be the energy scales in which our proposal could be sensitive to. And this is the scales where we think this could be promising. So I think now I'm gonna be focusing more into applications into um, uh, ruling out ultra light dark matter candidates or well, or detecting that. And I have a new PhD student who is going to be working with me in that direction. Um, so people usually ask me, how is it possible that you can measure gravitational waves with such a small thing? And that's because they're thinking about interferometry in space where the sensitivity is um, limited by Delta L over L so delta L for a gravitational wave, the change in length of the interferometer is a, a fraction of the size of the nucleus of the atom. And that's why the length has to be uh, three kilometers or so. But we're not using interferometer in space, we're using interferometer in frequency, and actually we're using um, quantum resonance. So this is the frequency of the modes that add up to the frequency of the wave. And actually the first instruments ever built to detect gravitational waves were based on resonance. They were called Weber bars, but they were not quantum. So this is, for example, one of them. These um, cylinders have vibrational modes 
that resonate with gravitational waves, and they were cool to four Kelvin. But even for VCs, if you prepared the state in a classical state, let's say in a thermal state, it wouldn't have the sensitivity to detect gravitational waves. You really need the entanglement and the squeezing of, uh, uh, of the atoms in, in order to be able to get good sensitivities. Now it's possible to cool uh, Weber bars and people do this in places like Fermilab or, or CERN to uh, milli Kelvin, but still at those temperatures, you're still in the classical regime. So a BEC is some sort of quantum Weber bar where the temperature is 10 order of magnitude colder than this 4K. And there you can use squeezing and parametric amplification and all the features from quantum metrology, which are really um, key for the detection. Um, so this is also showing how the speed of sound is in rubidium would be typical 10 millimeters per second. So this is many orders of magnitude um, and smaller than the speed of light. And because of that, then you can, um, to resonate with the gravitational waves, you can take a, a system which is much smaller than if you did that with light. So uh, for um, phonons is 10 to the minus one to 10 to the minus three millimeters as compared to if you try to use resonance, which wouldn't make sense, but it's interesting to see the numbers. With light, you would need something that ranges between three kilometers and 3000. And actually the lower end uh, exactly matches matches the size of the arms in LIGO. Of course, they don't use resonance, but it's interesting to see those scales. So we did some work on constraints of dark energy. Um, this is a, a proposal by a proposal of um, Claire Barrage and her uh, colleagues looked at how could you measure um, constrained dark energy models using atom interferometry. And we showed that by trapping the atoms instead in a BC, this is the experimental result using her proposal. And now using trap BCs, we made a theoretical prediction, uh, taking into account noise, showing that in principle, you should be able to extend this parameter scale. And um, yes, finishing, we applied this to measure the local gravitational field and its gradient. And the nice thing is that we get similar sensitivities, but you could do it in a much smaller volume. And for the gradiometer is very interesting because gradiometer usually they measure gravity at three different points at different points. But here you could really see the derivative within the small volume. So I finish here just like saying thank you and, and pointing out again, I guess my most important point is that there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, possibilities that quantum technologies are bringing into the plate and that I think that our difficulties in understanding the interplay on quantum mechanics in general relativity so far come from the fact that we haven't been able to do these experiments. But now that this possibility opens up, I think it's going to be very exciting to do more meaningful theories taking into account experimental results. And yes, I, I probably went over time. But since, since nobody was stopping me, I was no, kind of... The... No, I think it's fine because uh, anyway, we started five minutes later and, and, and we have a, uh, you know, a compact audience. So I think, uh, yeah, we can have some discussions now. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, so um, uh, yeah, if anyone has a question, please, please go ahead first. Yeah, and I'll also ask a few later on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe I will then start with a first question, okay, uh, Yvette. So, yes. so this uh, the the tree. The, uh, can you uh, describe the treater uh, you have? Is is not a normal SU three treater, right? It's it converting. Uh, uh, it's, it's like a parametric down conversion. Um, is that right or is I, the normal? I I sh I well the thing is first we do like a parametric down conversion with two modes. So, I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we prepare the bulk of the BC in a coherent state. Actually, that's like the normal state for the bulk. And then the phonon modes first would be in the vacuum. But mm -hmm. then you can excite them by changing the length of the trap. And this mm -hmm. is the two mode squeezing operation using the covariance matrix formalism. Mm -hmm. and this is how the Twitter looks like. 
Okay, so is the treater a product of uh, like uh, SU11 with tumor squeezing and a normal like three mode uh, thing like SU3? Is is it like a product of two the things success successfully? Mm -hmm. Okay, so th this is SU11. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that is SU11. But you see here, SU uh, like a signature of SU11 is this hyperbolic signs. Yeah, yeah. So here you have SU2, but you get the cosines and the sines, but mm -hmm. you have instead of, I mean, the normal SU2 would be with two modes, mm -hmm. but now okay, you so have this is the normal treater. Okay, so this is like a SU3 with mixing three modes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. I see. Yes. I see. Okay. yes. Um, and my, my natural. Yeah, most no, natural I must say that natural. actually we, we got. We got this idea from from a paper um, mm. that's called pumped pumped up SU11 interferometry, which introduces this Tritter transformation. But this was meant to the spatial interferometry. Mm. But we inspired this on on because we saw how incredible it um, increased the sensitivity. So we basically just took their idea for the Tritter in that setting. And applied it to these like sharp modes and frequency and, and got very positive results. Okay. So so um Yvette, I'll ask you a more basic question. So the Weber bar is is of course a one mode without any, you know, without any other modes. It's just like a one phonon mode to, which you are using to detect the gravitational wave. And um, of course, you can squeeze it uh, for uh, for more sensitive position detection. Just a single mode squeezing. Okay, so uh, how is that? Uh, why do you need uh, like you need two more? Seem to be needing two more squeezing and doing even better with this other new thing. The the, the so so is there a kind of uh, a more physical explanation of where the advantages are coming from? Well, the, the very big advantage really comes from the Tritter because um, what we were doing before was just, um, it's here, um, was just, you know, we were not using the bulk. So you had your, your phonons in the ground state and we were just, um, well, your system in the ground state and we were just exciting two frequency modes, two modes squeezing them, letting them interact and then with the gravitational wave and then measuring. And this had a scaling that go that went like the number of phonons, um, the square root of the number of phonons times the number of atoms. And yeah, I mean, this is okay, but you know, uh, when you then add the pump, the ground state has a lot of atoms. So if you think about this, it's like how many atoms can you squeeze um, mm -hmm. Well, if you want to get squeezing of the order of, let's say, 1.5, well, you can squeeze very few atoms. One, one point I have in the squeezing parameter. You know? mm -hmm. So, well, it, I don't think it's very well known how much you can squeeze in the lab. We did some theoretical predictions of that. But if you want to be conservative and think, okay, we can't squeeze that much, this scaling is not going to be good enough. However, the pump can have up to eight, 10 to the eight atoms. And when you add the, the tritter, sort of the number of atoms comes up into your quantum Fisher information. And then that increases the sensitivity by many orders of magnitude. Hmm. So that's, okay. that's the key thing. W when we did this old, old thing, you could also take two in like um, separable single mode squeezing and the in that case the scaling is not so different okay okay i see so so i think that the, the the main thing is um bringing in the total number of atoms as your resource into the quantum fisher information by um beam splitting with the bulk mm -hmm. okay so so somehow a larger number of um total Atoms uh, in the mean, the mean, the mean field large is also helping you somehow. Right? Oh yes, you de you definitely need that. You need very big BCs, and actually it's very interesting because I found this paper from two thousand and six where they had ten to the eight sodium atoms in a BC, but mm -hmm. 
but mm -hmm. people lost interest in getting big VCs at some point because you could do most experiments of interest with 10 to the five, 10 to the six atoms. So why, you know, go through the uh, difficulties of making big VCs if you can already learn your physics with fewer atoms. So mm -hmm. kind of groups that were working in that direction lost interest, but it has some sort of revived. I was um, talking to um, Chris Foote in Oxford and he was saying that um, he has a BC with stonium with very big atoms, mm -hmm. but they're just, you know, they just on its own like this or for older experiments and so having many atoms doesn't make, you know, is not needed. Whereas here is really key to get the high sensitivities. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Thanks. others have some questions. Yeah. Um, I, I also apologize for something. I think maybe what has happened is since we normally do our talks at uh, four o'clock, well, or last few months we have been doing, maybe that's what, so at least I see one person who will, Hori, who has just come in. Oh, so yeah. maybe, we, maybe we kind of, um, because changing the time suddenly wasn't a good idea, maybe. Yeah. You know, anyway. But, uh, uh, don't worry, I mean, this, yeah. these things happen and I, I, don't, right, right. I, don't, I don't mind this. Yeah. yeah. We always happy to, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, but it was nice for us to hear <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah so any, anyone else has some questions? Maybe? Can I ask this a very basic question? Um, what is uh, what are the key advantages drawbacks if you compare spatial and frequency interferometry? Um, mm. Okay, yeah. So, so like I said, in terms of, um, for example, they have many different applications. So, if you want to talk about the one in particular that I spoke about today, which is gravitational waves, is that atom interferometry. Uh, works for um, low frequencies like 10 to the minus two, whereas we for 10 to the minus 10 to the um, three to 10 to the seven. So the sources of noise at different frequencies are very different. So in our case, for example, seismic noise doesn't play um, uh, such a big role because it occurs at lower frequencies. So that could be affecting more atom interferometry but the atoms are in free fall, then in our case, in principle, it could affect more because they're trapped, but they're at different um, frequencies. Um, uh, yes, I guess that the sources of noise in, in both settings are, are, are different, which I, I think that is perhaps sort of a, a good thing. So each one would have different drawbacks. And in our case, because the atoms are trapped trapped in, in instabilities are a big thing. So um, in atom interferometry, you wouldn't have three body recombination sort of limiting you know, the sensitivity because you can basically make interactions zero. Whereas we need some interactions, but when you have the interactions, then there is a probability that you get three body recombination and lose your particles. And that ends up being the limiting fa factor on the lifetime of the phonons. So in, in that sense, there's, there's also a difference. And I guess if you go through all the different sources of noise, you will find that um, you know they're, they're quite different. Um, and I guess, uh, in terms of the sensitivity. So when you calculate all what the sources of noise do, you end up with a sensitivity, a calculation on the sensitivity that's like, let's say more realistic. And I think they're actually in that sense, they're quite similar. Hmm. It's just that in, it's a different frequency um, domain. And in this case, you could miniaturize detectors. And that's what I, um, I, I'm patenting at the moment because miniaturizing detectors is, is a very important thing, has a lot of commercial applications. Hmm. So Yvette, would, would uh, things like um, Schrodinger cats in frequency domain uh, make sense or be useful? Like uh, you have all uh, uh, phonons in one frequency excited or phonons in a different frequency excited? Uh, you know what? Probably, probably yes, but that is very difficult for me to calculate because I've been using the advantages 
of um, the covariance matrix formalism that makes mathematics right. very, yeah. Yeah. very yeah. easy. Mm -hmm. so I've been sticking to Gaussian states, so probably those would be the more sensitive states. But for me, mathematically calculating that would be a nightmare, Sugato, because you know, the volume of transformations are Gaussian transformations. So it all fits very nice as long as you, you stick to the covariance matrix formalism. Mm. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure that would give advantages. Mm. It's just perhaps for, for me. Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah. not the easiest thing to calculate. No, 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 no. Actually, I think quite difficult. Mm. Yeah. One needs someone brave who wants to do that calculation. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the thing is, the, these are, um, the, these things are, are, are com I think they're complicated conceptually because you need to, you know, quantum field theory and curve space time and all of those ingredients with quantum metrology and, and so on. But what really makes it, you know, doable is uh, using the covariance matrix formalism that at the end makes the quantum metrology calculation and all of that uh, relatively simple. Mm -hmm. No, I see, I see, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, so, if um, do people have some other uh, questions, maybe for for uh, Yvette or um, maybe have you have you compared your? Uh, this is just a popular question. Have you compared your sensitivities with? Uh, I mean, the frequency is of course is a gravitational wave thing, right? It's it's a different uh, matter, but uh, otherwise, have you compared with? Um, other sensitivities in the in the market, right? For, uh, like uh, like atom interferometry, for example, for for uh, for your uh, like uh, gradients and curvature kind of things. Yes, yes. I mean, for the for the local gravitational field, we mm -hmm. found the same sensitivities as in atom interferometry. Of course, mm -hmm. atom interferometry is an experimental result. And now ours is a numerical computation taking into account the sources of noise. So mm -hmm. in a sense, it's an unfair comparison, but the I best we can do so far. But at okay. least in principle, um, you know, if our simulations and calculations are, are correct, you should get similar sensitivities. But you could do the when people can, you know, build smaller vacuum chambers and lasers and all of these things, mm -hmm. you you should be able to do it in a, a smaller volume. Where we do get um, pre a prediction for um, higher uh, sensitivities is for the radiometer. In that case, we um, and so that's in this. There's a, a paper on the archive where we do that. And there we show that we predict two orders of magnitude improvement on the current sensitivities for the radiometers. So I think that's my last slide. Um, this one, but yeah, I didn't put the details there, but we we do have um, um, a paper uh, on, online. I think it's just called phononic quantum mm -hmm. gradiometer with, um, you know, my name and Dennis Ratzel, and then you can, you can get that, that comparison. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah. Um, maybe then we will call, uh, so if uh, there are no other questions, should we call the talk uh, an end? And, and maybe Yvette, you can, if you can stay a little bit, uh, five, five, 10 minutes sure. longer, yeah? Then, Yes. Quick chat after that. Uh, yes, uh, sure. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming, by the way. So I, I, I know this probably the timing has been a bit bad. Um, yeah, thanks, Daniel, for coming. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think uh, that uh, people are just emerging out of lots of <laughs> corrections and things. And uh, I think there have been conferences in the past few weeks and things, so probably the, the timing has been a bit bad. But anyway, uh, I think it, it was still very interesting. And, yeah. Yes, thank you very, very much for, for this um, invitation. And yeah.
that's that's great so bye everyone bye bye <laughs> so i stay on this line right yeah maybe just to be uh, uh,